I'm, re I'm reading Matt's comment now. Um, I don't understand how a lack of patent protection will work in some parts of the economy. Pharmaceuticals, um, for example, um, prices are inflated. Uh, okay, what would be the incentive for these companies to extend large amounts of capital? Okay. Well, I think I, I think I know where you're going. I've heard this. The, the, let, let me just answer this in a couple of ways. Um, first of all, I don't know if, if you've read a lot of Rand and others on, on like the antitrust question, for example. Uh, okay, let me read the rest of it. Um, okay. Well, I, I would say first, as a libertarian, our our view is moral. Okay. Our view is moral. That is, the question is primarily who has the property right. So, for example, on antitrust, a lot of uh, utilitarian type free market types would say they have a, these arguments for why you don't need antitrust law. But they're not really against them in principle if you do need them. They just think that there are good econ economic reasons to think that antitrust is not necessary because companies can't really collude that successfully uh, because of the nature of the market. Uh, but a more principled view is, but companies have the right to co to collude. They have the right to pr fix prices, as long as they're not violating anyone's property rights. They have the right to do that, and I, I think that's the fundamental approach to IP. Why do you have the right to tell me I can't use my own property in the way that I see fit, even with something uh, my own invention, which is what patent laws do? So if two companies are competing. And they're trying to find uh, this this uh, this wonder drug, and they both find it around the same time. The first one who gets to the patent office can stop the other one from using their own idea. Why is that just? And I don't think saying asking a question, well, what's what's the first company's incentive to to invest in this R and D? Asking a question is not an argument. I'm not being critical of you. I'm just saying it's not an argument, and it. Asking a question doesn't justify the use of state force against my property rights. I mean, it just doesn't. Um, the only thing that justifies that is if I commit aggression, and the competitor hasn't committed aggression. They're just using their own property as they see fit. Now, I would highly recommend that you go to the free online copy of the book by uh, McKelly, um, Boldrin, and David Levine called Against Intellectual Monopoly. You can find the link on the resources section of c4sif.org. Slash resources. There's a link to their book there. There's a chapter on pharmaceutical patents, which is always trotted out as the um, the best example of why we need patents. And they do a great empirical case, just devast showing that actually it is not in practice in today's world uh, that useful. Uh, or, or, or sorry, it's not essential. Uh, you have to read it. It's thorough and just devastating. They show that a lot of the uh, um, the cost uh, of of patents. Or for uh, advertising, or for things that are not protected by patents, etc. Uh, so take a look at that. Um, and second of all, I would say this: just as a as sort of a, a common sense matter, we have a, a situation where we have the state, which hampers human life in a severe way. It imposes untold costs on companies, regulations, the FDA process itself. Um, taxes, uh, inflation, uh, export and import controls, um, all kinds of things like this, which totally um, uh, are like a huge weight impressed upon these R&D companies. Just imagine if we could cut the corporate income tax rate by 90% and the income tax rate on personal people, on individuals by 90% um, so that they would be richer and have more money to spend on these drugs and things like this, and and, and it'd be cheaper to hire employees if you didn't have pro-union pro legislation and environmental laws and all these things. Um, they would have so much more money in the first place that th they would have a lot more money to spend on R&D. And to the idea of entrusting with the state, okay, which imposes all these penalties and drags and weights on companies – and on innovation and progress, to give that to, to ask that state to give me a monopoly that I can use their state courts for to harm my competitors for a temporary time, so I can charge a slightly temporarily monopoly price for my product 
to make it a little bit more attractive is insane. I mean, you don't trust these criminals to do that. And if, if the state's imposing cost upon cost upon cost upon cost upon you, why would you not want to just say get rid of these costs instead of saying give me a temporary monopoly where I can have a little bit higher profit to make up for all the costs you've imposed on me? Just stop, just stop uh, imposing costs on me in the first place. So that's my primary view on that, and um, and as a practical matter, I mean, just imagine this: you go down to the store. We've all seen this. You'll see Tylenol for you know six dollars and generic acetaminophen for three dollars, half the price. Some people buy Tylenol. Some people buy acetaminophen. Why do some people pay twice the price? Because they trust the brand name. I mean, there's an advantage to being first to market. There's an advantage to your reputation and your name. There are spillover effects. There are any number of reasons why you want to make money, uh, why you would engage in R&D. Okay. Uh, Julie, why should I not share the key to your course via Facebook? Um, well, I would say it wouldn't be morally wrong because you can have uh, – Libertarianism is not – doesn't pretend to be the sole, the sole source of um, ethics in society. I mean there's personal morals, and there's reputation effects, and there are personal commitments and promises, uh, and there's also contracts. And, and you, know, you could say I – mean, I don't think we do it here because we don't care too much. I mean we're not worried about it. Mises is not into – it's not a money-making organization. Not that there's anything wrong with making money. They're trying to spread the word of economics and, 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 uh, and liberty and truth and all this. And that's why we open up so much for free. This course is – these the Mises Academy is done in a – we're selling a service where there's a, an instructor with personalized information and uh, you know, back and forth and things like this. And uh, to to get these professors to teach, they want to let them have some – a little profit to induce them to do it. So this is the one thing they do that they charge for. And they don't open up to the world. And there's a practical reason not to open it up. Now, why shouldn't you do it? I mean, if we had a contract, then you'd be a breach of contract. I don't think we would do that because we don't care too much because we kind of trust people. And we're not really worried about it. I mean, if people started doing that, I think we would just change the system a little bit and make the change the code every week, something like that. Um, yeah, I did talk about this earlier. Someone asked that question earlier. Um, so I, I'd say it's sort of – just bad form, but that's not a libertarian uh, issue. That's more. I'll be there in 15 to 20 minutes, so just wait for me. I'll read your book. Um, yeah, you could make a contract. You could say, I mean, if you wanted to, you could have a contract that said, uh, you know, every student who signs up uh, agrees to pay a thousand dollars damages to Mises if you reveal the key. I mean, I don't know, but. You could do things like that, but there's always – the choice is that alienating your customers when you do things like that. And I'm talking about a pure profit type thing, not just something like this. Um, so, I mean, you know, if you want to release it, <laughs> go ahead. I mean, you'd be, you might get booed by your fellow students, and then we would have to change the code. Um, uh, one problem is uh, – on Bob Murphy's course, by the way, someone did that apparently, and there was a troll in the room. They had to find a technical way to, to, to get around, and he was – every every other comment, he was saying um, uh, Austrian economics sucks, Bob Murphy sucks. I mean it was just – some troll was actually in the room, so I would think the students who are really interested in this wouldn't want outsiders involved who are, who are going to interfere with the, the, the lessons they paid for. Anyway, um, Chafalaya, your thoughts on logos? I was trying to utilize NFL logos for an event and got shut down for IP reasons. How do you utilize? Okay, so that's a good question. That's a trademark issue. Um, let me let me explain. A trademark is um, a mark that is used to identify the source of a service or a good. Okay, nothing wrong with using a trademark. This is what people would do. It's just the same thing as using your name, saying you know I am, I am, a, you know I'm John. You know, I'm John Black, and I, I've had this job and the circle of friends, and this is my reputation, and please hire me. I mean people use names as identifiers. Um, in, in my view, in libertarianism, in a libertarian society, the only type of trademark right you would have would be basically based on fraud. So if 
if I um, um, uh, let's say there's Coca, let's just say Coca-Cola. There's a Coca-Cola company. And they're selling a certain cola product under their name, Coca-Cola. Um, now, if I make a knockoff of Coca-Cola, and I'm selling it to people as Coca-Cola, but it's not genuine Coca-Cola, I'm defrauding these people, and they should be able to sue me. Which is why I think this would never be a major problem because you, you're only going to have fly-by-night operators who are doing this because they're going to be sued for fraud. The problem with trademark law is that it gives the right to sue to the competitor, to the original trademark owner, not to the customer. Now, in my view, the, the trademark owner is not he, he's not um, he's not violated, he's not harmed because he doesn't have a right to the customer's business. If the customer wants to change his mind because he um, for whatever reason, he has the right to do so. So Coca-Cola doesn't have the right to sue. Furthermore, trademark law is not always based upon fraud. So for example, if I sell you a $20 Rolex, which is a knockoff, now you're not defrauded because you know you're buying a fake Rolex. This is common. Rolex can still sue me, even though there's no fraud and there's no consumer confusion. <clears throat> so I think it should just be totally a fraud-based thing. I think trademark law should be just basically abolished and replaced by pure fraud, pure fraud law. Um, oh, Julie, I'm not saying it's personal, but uh, maybe I misunderstood your question. Um, well, let me let me read. Hold on a second. Let me read your question again. Why should you not share the key to the course by Facebook? Um, well, I think. If you understand the purpose of this Mises Academy system, it would be immoral because you know that you're – there's sort of a uh, – I don't know, a gentleman's agreement type thing here, which is – it's a moral thing outside the realm of pure libertarianism, but it's contemplated by it. I mean people can have morals. I just think it would be bad form because you'd be damaging what people are expecting here, and if people don't you know, cooperate, then we might have a worse course, and the whole Mises Academy might not work. I guess that's the reason, but there's no penalty. If, for you to do it, if that's what you're asking, no official legal penalty, and I would not be in favor of that. I mean, if someone did that, I would just say, well, you know, we have to find a different way to uh, find a, a cost of exclusion to make this course work, right? Because you know, I wouldn't teach this course if I didn't make a little money off of it. But I'm not doing it for money, really. I'm doing it for fun and for, for the experience and to interact and um, and to, to spread the word. Um, so if we can't find a way to make it work, then we'd have to find some other way. So. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it was Krugman or not. Um, okay, Chaffalai. I only I pretended to be officially representing the NFL organizations. I would be fraudulent. No. Yeah. If I understand the hypo you're giving me, um, yeah, I think I think that's correct. And I think that we would have to have a strong presumption of you know caveat emptor. In other words, look, you got to treat people as a grown-ups. And if, if you're having an NFL slogan logo on your, I don't know, your booth or whatever you're doing, you know, people shouldn't assume that that you are saying is you're the, you're authorized by the NFL. I mean, if you put on there officially authorized by the NFL, in fact, let me go back a couple slides. This is you should take a look at this um, this post here by uh, about Nina Paley's idea, Carl Fogel's idea of the creator endorsed mark. So if you actually Say I authorized the use of this, and they put it on there, and then you know they didn't. That would be a trademark infringement. Um, okay. Um, some people are leaving. By the way, we're at 9:30. I don't mind personally staying much longer, but I'm afraid to cheat some people out of um, the discussion who had who left at the course time. Although they can watch the recording later, so let's not go too much longer. Maybe. Take 10 or 15 minutes max more, but go ahead. We'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, okay, Julian's question. Well, this is basically the contractual copyright scheme that some have proposed, and it's somewhat related to Rothbard's idea. And your question is, in a libertarian world, could a music company make a contract with each um, CD buyer so you're not allowed to copy the CD? Yes, I think they could do that, but if you remember… Number one, let's go back to our contract idea. Contract is not binding obligation. It's just a, a network of, of transfers of title to property. So in other words, if I buy a CD and I agree to this, uh, this clause or provision you're talking about, I mean I have to agree to 
some consequence if I, if I do copy it. So really the contract just sets up a payment of money from me to the music company if I copy the CD. And if they can prove it, I guess. The cost of the song, 99 cents, I don't know. No. Of, of, of penalties. This is that's another reason they wouldn't even try it. I mean, they know that it's it's futile to even try to do this. And in the libertarian world, you wouldn't have government snooping and <coughs> subpoenas and all these uh, injunctions and orders from courts to to even try to go on a fishing expedition to figure out this in the first place. How do I view proprietary software code? I don't uh, I don't know what, what do you mean? How do I view it? I mean if Proprietary means different things. Do you do you mean DRM'd or well? So I mean, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm against it because uh, software. I, I'm not against DRM, and I'm not against um, um, you know password protected software or you have to have the encryption key to unlock it or the you know the code that's fine if you want to do that that's fine I mean like in this course right we, you have a pass key um, uh, but proprietary usually means you own it right proprietary you're the property owner and that is you're only the owner of it if there's IP which is patent so patent and copyright primarily copyright are the two uh, the two IP types that cover uh, software um, code software code itself. Uh, I mean, without, I, without patent and copyright, you would not need um, copyleft and GNU and, and in fact, it would make no sense because th those are all licenses and a license is just permission. That's what a license means. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you, uh, creating a false encryption key would be fraud. Uh, I don't understand Give me an example. Who's who is who is creating the key and giving it to who? 
You mean like if I if I'm like a, I'm, if I'm fake Microsoft and I sell uh, I sell a bootleg copy of um of of I sell a bootleg copy of Windows and I say if you pay me the money I'll give you the key and then but I can't give you the key because I'm not the original vendor. So it's just a scam you're saying, just a scam by a. Uh, I think that'd be some type of fraud or some type of theft. Sure. But that's another reason why the reputation would be more important in a patent-free and a copyright-free world. You wouldn't buy from some Joe Blow uh, on the internet who you don't know. You would use trusted systems like you know an Amazon or some vetted software distributing network, or you'd use the you know go to Microsoft.com and use them, whatever. <coughs> I think uh, Alexis. I think he was envisioning some software vendor who was a pirate who was pretending to have a key, but they didn't. So they're just stealing the money. Um, so Locke says you get your money if you mix labor with it. Um, well, that's a good question. Um, and I actually think you 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 kind of hit on what I what I have myself seen is a big problem with the the entire Lockean framework. So Locke. Um, Uh, I mean, Jessica, I can't say whether it's wrong. I mean, you know, that's an ethical question. Um, I don't think it's wrong, but that's because you know you could imagine a similar license in a in a in a in a in a, in a copyright-free world, and then it would be contract breach to do it. But would that be likely a likely restriction that would be placed on you? I doubt it. Anyway, let's go back to this lock question of a Julian. So, what Locke says is that you own yourself, and therefore you own your labor, and therefore you own whatever you mix your labor with, which was already which was previously unowned. The problem with that argument is that it's 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 um, um it's 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 crankish because to say you own yourself is not specific. I mean, what is yourself? I mean, I don't know what myself is. <clears throat> I know that I have a body. And every human has a body, which is a scarce resource. And there are sometimes scuffles and squabbles over these bodies. There's never a fight between two selves. There's a fight between people trying to control or hurt each other's bodies without their consent. So to be a self-owner means that you are the one who has the right to control who gets to use or touch or do something to your body. So that's all self-ownership means. Um, your labor is just an, one of the activities you can perform with your um, – with your body. So it's an action. Now, would you say you own your actions? I mean, I don't even know what that means. So I don't I don't really know what they mean when they say you own your labor. It's not a substance. It's just a thing you do with your body. So to say that you own your labor is just it, – it's a failure to be precise in thinking. Rothbard pointed out that you, we do not um, – Sorry about that. I hate when it does that. I don't know why it does that. Am I back? No. So, okay. Am I back? Hello? Test, test? So, I think Locke is actually correct in his basic argument, but he has an unnecessary step. Instead of saying um, you own your body, you own yourself, therefore you own your labor, therefore you own what you mix it with, I think the, a more direct argument is better. You just skip that, and you just say, look, <clears throat> if there's an unowned resource out there, and you are the first one to claim it by appropriating it, by mixing your labor with it, that's fine as a metaphor, but that means you transform it or you use it, you possess it, and you put up borders. Or you demonstrate that you want to own it. Sorry, not just temporarily possess it. Um, then by doing that, you establish a better claim than anyone else, right? 
So the reason is because anytime there's a there's a dispute over property, one of the people claiming it is is a latecomer with respect to the earlier possessor. And in my view, the very idea of property, which is that you have the right to continue to 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 write, to use something that you were a previous possessor of, not just bare possession, not just might makes right, not just the right to use it as long as you have it, but the idea that you have the right to settled possession of it, the right to possess it. That very idea implies that whoever has it now has a better claim against someone who comes later and tries to take it. That is, a late comer has a worse claim than an earlier comer. That is why the first guy to own it has a better claim than anyone. That is why homesteading works. So I think Locke is correct. He just includes these crankish notions of labor ownership, um, which I think was part and parcel of this quasi-mystical, confused idea of labor, um, which results from over-reliance on metaphors, not scientifically uh, clarifying the concepts that you're using and not being specific enough. I don't want to be harsh on Locke. I mean, he was great, and he was not standing on the shoulders of giants like we are now. Yes, yeah, not just transforming. It's basically, I think the, the fundamental concept, which is, is what Hoppe says, is in bordering, which is setting up borders. Somehow doing something with this resource to show the world that you are claiming it as yours. Putting a fence around it, plucking the apple, putting it in your possession. All these things are signals or signs to the, to the world that, ah, that's that guy's property. So now I can navigate around it and leave him alone and let him use it in peace, and I'll go get my own property. <clears throat> so, I, and in fact, I believe that this confusion about labor also was mixed in with Adam Smith's ideas about the labor theory of value, and uh, which led to the, the Marxian ideas about alienation, and uh, all their class warfare between uh, uh, the employers and the and the labor they call it, you know, the, the workers, and um, the labor theory of value itself. So I think I think that this this whole fixation on labor is unscientific, overly metaphorical, confused, and has led to, in political theory, the intellectual property and reputation rights mistake, and in the realm of um, uh, economics has led to Marxism and um, uh, bad economics. I, I'm actually not sure where this. I don't know if Locke is the one that came up with this labor stuff. I mean, I think he was part of the, you know, the milieu at the time. And uh, um, I, I'm not a big historian, so I'm not sure where it came from. I think it was around before him. He was kind of putting it together. And I'm not sure about the transmission of those ideas from him to Adam Smith in the economic realm, but there's some connection, I believe. Yes, in fact, I think creating is, is a bad – I mean, I, I think what you create is you create value uh, – so you create wealth by transforming things that you own already. Um, you could say that, in a way, an unowned piece of land – doesn't exist in a, in a practically logical sense until someone regards it as a good and homesteads it. But that's hyper-subjective, hyper and, so, and so you could say as soon as you homestead it, you create it because it wasn't really a good before. right? You just caused it to come into existence as part of the, the universe of goods by regarding it as a good. This is the subjectivism of Austrianism, which is good, but if you take it too far, you become hyper-subjectivist. I think it's just complete nonsense to say that you create a piece of land by homesteading it. No, I think what you do is you appropriate it. You appropriate it. But I think you appropriate it by embordering it or fencing it. Yes, that that is my view. That is Hoppe's view. And if you if you read in his like chapters one and two of a theory of socialism and capitalism, he goes into this a lot. It's really good. Anything else? Well, I agree. That's why I say in bordering, in bordering in general. It, 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 for land, it would be fencing. For other things, it would be a different type of in bordering.
Um, Matt, there might be some pragmatism. I mean, pragmatism is not always bad. I mean, there's a practical aspect to all this. We all want to get along. We all want to find rules that we can use to have prosperity and cooperation and peace. Um, okay, let me answer this question, then I will bail out, too. Um, um, but um, but for the value question, the, the point is that you cannot own value to things. You only own the physical integrity of, of property that you own. The value, I mean, you don't need to own the value of how you regard it. You can regard it however you want. But the value of how it's regarded by outsiders, that's how they regard it. You don't have the right, property right to how they regard it or value it. So there cannot be any um, um, property right in the value of things because that would be like the property right in other people's brains, right? how they think about or regard your, your stuff. Anyway, let's call it an end. Uh, I've enjoyed it tonight, and feel free to – oh, oh, I have to make one announcement. I, I'll send it on the list. I am going to um, Ohio for a Federal Society debate on Wednesday, so I cannot do the regular – Q&A at the same time. I'll be on a plane. So I'm either going to do it earlier in the day on Wednesday or perhaps I will do it on Friday. I'll post on the list and ask everyone what they prefer. So good night, everyone, and I will talk to you all at the next Q&A sometime this week. Bye-bye.